Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Jerry Zaremski and I'm the Washington Bureau Chief of the Buffalo News and President of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests who are here today along with the broadcast audience that's watching us on C-SPAN. We're looking forward to, today, to today's speech and afterwards I'll ask as many questions as I can, time permitting. Please hold your applause during the speech so that we have as much time for questions as possible. For our broadcast audience, I'd like to explain that if you hear applause, it may be from the guests and members of the general public who attend our luncheons, and not necessarily from the working press. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Harry Stauffer, Washington correspondent for Automotive News. Glenn Somerville, economics correspondent for Reuters. Chris Smith a consultant for Cerberus Capital Management and a guest of the speaker. Dave Shepardson, Washington correspondent for the Detroit News. Marilyn G. Wax, national economics correspondent for, for Cox Newspapers. Billy Cooper, managing director of Cerberus Capital Management and a guest of the speaker. Skipping over the podium, Angela Gryland Keene of Bloomberg News, the chair of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Skipping over our guests for just one second, John Hughes of Bloomberg News and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's event, Tim Price, Managing Dir Director of Cerberus Capital Management and a guest of the speaker, Allison Fitzgerald, Treasury Reporter for Bloomberg, Justin Hyde, Washington Correspondent for the Detroit Free Press, uh, Hidenaka Kato, Chief of the, the Chief Washington Correspondent for Nikkei Newspaper, and Brett Ferguson, Economics Reporter for BNA. <laughs> Americans were surprised to wake up one morning in 1998 and learn that Chrysler, the creator of the minivan and the builder of the K car, was going to be owned by a German company. Nine years later, Chrysler's majority stake is coming back into an American company's hands, and our speaker today has an awful lot to do with that. John Snow is chairman of Cerberus Capital Management LP, a New York private equity firm. Two months ago, Cerberus said it had agreed to buy an 80% stake in the automaker from Daimler Chrysler AG of Stuttgart, Germany. The sale is expected to close before the end of September. The $7.4 billion that Cerberus is investing for its stake in Chrysler is about a fifth of what Daimler agreed to pay for the car maker back in 1998. Of course, here in Washington, we're not yet used to thinking about cars when we hear John Snow's name. We instead tend to think about T-bills. Our speaker was U.S. Treasury Secretary for President George W. Bush for more than three years, from 2003 to 2006. He was successful in selling the idea of tax cuts to the Congress, and while he was Treasury Secretary, the economy grew 4% and unemployment fell. But his greatest challenge may lie ahead of him. Chrysler, once known as part of the Big Three, fell to fourth place in U.S. auto sales last year as Toyota surged ahead. The gap is widening. Last month, Chrysler's sales fell 1.4%, while Toyota's grew 10%. Can John Snow make Chrysler more competitive? He says his company is prepared to invest a lot of money into the car maker to make it work. He also acknowledges that the course ahead will be difficult. Chrysler has said that it plans to cut 13,000 jobs over the next three years and that it also plans to close a Delaware manufacturing plant. Our speaker will draw on a long transportation record as he forges ahead. Back in the Gerald Ford administration, Snow worked to deregulate the airline, barge, and rail industries as an official in the U.S. Department of Transportation. And before he was Treasury Secretary, our speaker spent more than a decade as Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the CSX Corporation Railroad. That means our speaker today could talk about planes, trains, or automobiles. But instead, he's going to tell us about the role that pi private equity plays in U.S. manufacturing in the global economy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Snow to the National Press Club. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, appreciated that, uh, that nice, warm in introduction. In fact, I was enjoying it so much, I was just hoping it would go on and on. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to be back here. I spoke 
to the National Press Club, which obviously is one of the great forums of this country to address public policy issues. I spoke here in, uh, in 2004, uh, and the subject then was uh, the outlook for the economy uh, and the larger question of American competitiveness and how we fit in with, with uh, the larger forces of the global economy. Uh, I was also here then to talk about uh, the importance of the President's tax cuts. Uh, tax cuts which I think now that the verdict is in uh, clearly have led to greater prosperity uh, across, uh, across America. So it's good, uh, good, good to be back here. It's like, uh, like a homecoming for me, being back at the Press Club, being back in Washington, not far from the Treasury Building, uh, to a city that I lived in for many, many, many years and where I have uh, many friends, and to be, uh, in effect, a unifying force between the two industries I have worked in, transportation, and I see many transportation people here today, and transportation press, and uh, the financial press uh, and people from the world of, 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 of finance. So uh, I'm delighted, uh, really delighted to be here and see so, so many old friends. Uh, when I look at my friends from the financial press who are here who covered the Treasury Department, uh, I'm reminded of, uh, of something the President said to me as he was about to introduce me to America as his new new uh, Treasury Secretary nominee. We were sitting next to each other and he uh, looked over at me and he said, John, uh, uh, really glad to have you aboard. Uh, it's going to be a great experience. Uh, the, the staff's high on you here. They tell me you're a good speaker. And I said, well, thank you, Mr. President. That's a real compliment. He said, no, they, they, they really are. They're high on you. They, 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 they say you articulate uh, well and give a good speech and that you do it often extemporaneously. You do it without notes. And I says, well, thank you, Mr. President. I said, that's a, that's a real compliment. He says, yeah, that's a great skill, John. I, I admire that skill. He said, from now on, use notes. <laughs> and I think he had the members of the financial press very much in mind, Glenn and Allison and Kevin and the rest of everybody. Uh, when, when, he offered, uh, when he offered that uh, observation. I, I came to understand the wisdom of the President's advice to me. Uh, and I learned the unique form of questions that come to you when you're the Treasury Secretary. Uh, when I came in, of course, early 03, the economy was still struggling, still reeling from the effects of 9-11 and the recession of, of uh, March of 01 and the the uh, corporate scandals and the meltdown of the equity markets, and those effects were still in the economy, so the growth was anemic. And you can follow the course of an, of an economy by the questions that you get from the financial press. And the first question always was, in those days, Mr. Secretary, aren't you concerned? Aren't you disappointed? Aren't you worried about the pathetic performance of the American economy? these anemic growth rates. Aren't you worried? And I would respond, well, no. Uh, look, there's a natural rhythm to an economy. Uh, we have automatic adjustment processes. The American economy is very resilient. It will recover, and, it's gonna, and that recovery is going to be aided by the fact the President is putting into effect these, these lower taxes. And lower taxes will mean a job creation, investment, and uh, lay the foundation for prosperity. Well, lo and behold, we got the growth. Then the question became, Mr. Secretary, there's growth in the economy now, but where are the jobs? Aren't you concerned that we don't see any jobs being created? And you would say, well, look, first you get the economy going, uh, you get investment going, you get business confidence, and then uh, businesses will create jobs. And the jobs came, of course. Now we've got eight million plus from those days. And, uh, uh, as the jobs came, there, there was no more talk of the so-called jobless recovery, which was much on people's minds back then in 03 and early 04. The question became, Mr. Secretary, that the economy is growing now and we see jobs, but what about wages? You know, wages are stuck. Uh, 
stagnant wages, no improvement in, in workers' conditions, uh, and you'd say, well, first you do this, and then you do that, and then as labor markets get stronger, wages pick up. As I was leaving office, I was intrigued to get a new question. Mr. Secretary, uh, with the rise in wages, aren't you worried about inflation? <laughs> I kept wondering when I was going to get the question, Mr. Secretary, aren't you delighted? <laughs> aren't you pleased? Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good being here today. As I say, it's like a, like a homecoming for me, seeing so many old friends and being back in a city I know so well and lived in so long. Uh, but we're also celebrating, Jerry, as you said, another homecoming. And that's the return of Chrysler to its uh, American roots. This is one of the iconic companies in all of American history. And uh, uh, now it's coming home. We hope to close the Chrysler transaction here in, uh, in the next, uh, within the thir third quarter, in the next, uh, next month or so. Uh, and it's an important transaction for the American auto industry, but it's also uh, a milestone event for private equity, private investment. Go back 30 years when Chrysler was experiencing economic difficulties. Uh, then Chrysler turned to the government. And there was a government, quote, bailout. Today, as Chrysler faced difficulties, uh, private equity provided the answer. And the question on your mind probably is, what is private equity? What is private investment? What is this all about? Who is Cerberus? And do you have any chance to be successful? And how can you be successful when others haven't? Well, first a word on, on private equity. It isn't really all that mysterious. Private investment is not all that mysterious. It wasn't around 30 years ago when Chrysler was first in trouble. Uh, and when they turned to the government for the rescue. Uh, in that intervening uh, 30 years, one of the most important developments in financial markets has been the, the growth of private investment, private equity. Uh, and it's playing a powerful and important role in, or, in, in the way the world of work and business and investment is, is organized today. It's helping to make public companies uh, more efficient, it's helping to keep public companies on their toes, and it's helping to restore companies that haven't performed well uh, to sustainable profitability. That's really what a firm like Cerberus does. We invest in underperforming companies and uh, uh, make money for our investors by turning them around. Our, our motto really is to buy and to fix and to hold. And you say, who are those investors? Well, those investors are the pension plans of America. Those investors are, uh, are state government retirement plans. They're the endowments of universities. Uh, my mother was a school teacher in Ohio. And uh, she retired uh, in, the, in the 60s, in the 1960s, with a retirement then that of about $7,200 a year. The most she ever made as a school teacher was $10,000. And I sometimes think back to my mother and recall the struggles she had in those days, making ends meet on $7,400 a year. How much better off she would have been if the Ohio State teachers pension plan had been invested in private equity because what private equity does is provide higher rates of return, better retirements for a broad cross-section of, of America. But for us to do that, for us to achieve that objective, and it's, it's an objective that we've been successful at, uh, as evidenced by the fact that this fund has grown from a very small amount of dollars invested in 1992 when it was established to a very sizable uh, a, a number of dollars today. Uh, 
uh, evidence of this success, uh, we, we, we wouldn't be building that fund unless uh, the pension plans and the endowments and wealthy individuals saw uh, an opportunity to do better than they would do in other investments. And we have an obligation to them to do so. We have a fiduciary duty to those investors to do, to, to do well for them. And we only uh, do well for them, and this is the critical point, we only do well for them if the companies we invest in turn around. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you take underperforming companies and turn them and turn them around? Well, basically we, we do that by giving these underperforming companies a new environment. Uh, an environment in which the managers of these companies are free from the requirements of the public markets and the quarterly reports and the analyst meetings and meeting a target by a, by a penny a share. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, uh, American businesses often take time to fix. Uh, they can't be turned around on a dime. And they need an environment in which the owners are patient, in which the owners take a long view. And we're patient, and we take a long view. We understand the complexity of running businesses and fixing businesses, and we augment the management teams of the companies we invest in uh, with a team of proven experts, 150 or so proven experts, people who have run major companies, uh, people who have seen virtually every business problem that exists and know how to approach it and fix it. That team of, of, of pros, business pros, uh, is available to uh, the companies we buy to uh, support them, to augment them, uh, and to, uh, to work closely with them to produce better, better results. You know, sometimes fixing a company takes a new pair of glasses, takes a fresh, takes a fresh look. And what we try and do is provide a fresh look. We ask a lot of questions. We're, uh, we're an attentive parent. We pay close attention. But we tell the management teams, look, you're now free from those quarterly reports. You're now free from those analyst meetings. You can focus all of your effort. You can focus all of your energy on running the business. And what a sense of relief that is to people to whom management is a calling, uh, to, to people who really want to make a business a success. And there are an awful lot of underperforming companies, companies with good potential. Uh, that need to invest for the long term, that need to have the freedom to implement those longer term plans, a freedom that unfortunately because of the all too often short term focus of public markets, uh, they aren't given. Now, we give the management teams of the companies we invest in that freedom. And it's amazing the energy that creates. It's an amazing thing to watch a company that has not worked well turn itself around and uh, the pride that the management team takes in, in those results. But we never buy a company with an exit strategy. We've learned that we can reward our investors by fixing companies and holding them. Because when you turn around a, an underperforming company, uh, wonderful things happen. Uh, as you become competitive, uh, as you produce better products, as you invest for the long term, uh, and the company's results come in, they're, they're the source of a lot of free cash flow. <coughs> they're the source of, uh, of a lot of, uh, of, of profitability. And that's how we reward uh, in, investors. So fresh eyes, new environment, a long-term focus and patience. And this, this team of really world-class, uh, world-class managers who come in and help the existing management teams uh, uh, do, do well. 
Our economy is based on the success of our businesses. It was a theme I talked about often uh, as Treasury Secretary. Jobs, good jobs, come from well-performing companies. And the, the key to well-performing companies is to have an alignment of interest between the, the managers and the owners, and we get that in private equity. Uh, the key is, is to uh, continue to invest for the long term, not be short-sighted, and to be, be patient, and to have really talented people in these enterprises uh, who are committed to, to, to the success of the enterprise long term. Uh, so strong companies equal job security. We create jobs from competitive companies. Non-competitive companies don't create a lot of good jobs. Now let's turn to Chrysler. The question here is, how can you, how can you uh, do what others haven't done? How can you make a success of Chrysler? <clears throat> Well, we're investing in Chrysler because we're confident we can make a success of it. We wouldn't be investing in it unless we felt that way. Uh, Chrysler has a lot of strengths, enormous strengths. Got a great product line and a good pipeline of new products coming out. I'm glad there are some dealers here that I had a chance to talk to earlier who know those, who know those products. Uh, it's got a dedicated and committed workforce, proud of that company. There's a lot of pride in, that, in, that, in the workforce of that, of that company. Uh, and of course, we'll augment that, that management team uh, with this team of people I've told you about, these, these uh, world-class experts who will be available to the, to the management team at, at, uh, at, at Chrysler. Uh, basically, we're putting Chrysler in a new environment. Uh, Chrysler was an environment uh, before that didn't allow it to achieve its potential. Uh, it was a merger with Daimler that, that, that looked good, that uh, had promise, but didn't realize the full promise. And now Chrysler returning to, to the United States has a chance to fulfill its, 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 its promise. We're committed to doing it. We're going to put capital into it. We've made a major capital commitment. We've made a major resource commitment. We've made a major people commitment. And uh, we're not going to rest until we see Chrysler succeeding and the turnaround uh, a, uh, uh, a great newsworthy event for all of you who write about the automotive, the automotive industry. How can you do it, basically? Well, because it's our job. It's our job. Uh, Carpenters take old homes and rebuild them, right? That's what they do. What we do is take underperforming companies and return them to competitive success. Will it be easy? No. We're not naive. We know that uh, we face a lot of problems, global competition, uh, fuel prices, uh, the uh, the, the health care issues, rising health care costs, all have to be addressed, and we're committed to addressing them. There's a new challenge we face, though. Those of you who cover the automotive industry know about it, and that's uh, where Congress will go with this debate on, on CAFE. It's interesting, when I think back on my career, I'm, uh, I'm circling back on myself because in 1976, as the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, I wrote the first CAFE rules. Uh, and now we're facing a debate on, on where we should go with, with CAFE. Let me, let me say that, that where, where we're coming from on that. Uh, we understand fully the need to reduce American dependence on Middle Eastern oil. We understand as well the need to reduce tailpipe emissions, CO2 emissions. Uh, Therefore, we also are committed to uh, a proposal to raise CAFE. Now, I think over the last 30 years, the auto industry, unfortunately, has lost some credibility in this town. Uh, and you can't help sense that when you talk to people around, around Washington. Uh, we're not the old automobile industry. 
uh, we're the fresh eyes on today's problems. And we're committed to trying to find a solution uh, on the Hill that advances the objectives of less dependence on Middle Eastern oil, uh, less CO2, but does so in a way that sustains this great industry, that gives this industry uh, the opportunity to continue to be competitive and continue to succeed. My problem with the Senate bill is that while it, it pursues the objectives of cleaner air and, and, uh, and, and uh, less dependence on Middle Eastern oil, it does so in a disproportionate way. It visits too much of, of the answer to those problems on this one industry. This industry accounts for about less than 20 percent of the total uh, use of Middle Eastern uh, oil, of energy. Uh, and yet this legislation visits on this industry uh, a huge portion of the total burden of trying to find answers to CO2 and fuel economy. Uh, and it does so in a way that isn't balanced and really isn't workable. Uh, we uh, are supporting a proposal that would uh, very significantly raise uh, auto fuel economy standards, a large increase. Uh, but an increase that while it's a challenge and while it's difficult, uh, we can see our way to doing. Our problem with some of the proposals up there is that uh, given present technology, given the tastes of consumers and the need for us to produce cars people really want, uh, if we're going to succeed, uh, the legislation simply isn't, isn't workable. Uh, I want to commend uh, a number of people, too many to mention, but uh, the authors of, uh, of uh, H.R. 2927 have, have a good approach. Uh, Congressman Barton has come forward with a good approach. Uh, there's a rising, I think, understanding, increasing understanding of the need to get a workable solution here. And what we're committed to doing is, is to be part of finding that uh, that, that workable solution. Yesterday, the dealers were in town. And uh, uh, I'm told of a meeting that many of the, the dealers had up on the Hill. And some of these dealers were laying out to the, to the Congress the fact that unless we're able to sell cars people want, uh, we won't have a very good business. Some of these were minority dealers, dealers who'd made a great success of, of their business, who were uh, receiving a very sympathetic response when they said, Congressman, look, we want to be part of the solution, but, but let's make sure that solution is one that, uh, that, that's workable for this, uh, for this industry. That's, uh, that's what we want. I know a lot of people feel the auto industry has had its head in the sand, that it's stonewalled for 30 years, that it uh, has cried wolf, all those things. Uh, I think the auto industry today uh, recognizes that a new age has dawned, a new age is here, and uh, we're, we're uh, committed to being part of what is a uh, solution, uh, a balanced solution and a workable solution to these issues of overdependence on Middle Eastern oil and CO2. Uh, I thank you very much for the chance to be back here and now look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. First, a few questions kind of elaborating on the speech a little bit. You say that uh, Cerberus is in for the long run with Chrysler, but what's the long run? Five years, 10 years, infinity? Well, we've only been in this private equity business uh, since I think it's 1991 or two, and we've sold very few companies, <clears throat> so uh, we don't have a have a have a time time horizon there. Uh, what what we we uh, will do uh, is continue to use the approach we've used in our other businesses, which is invest in the business, invest in the people, uh, bring best technology to bear free the management team of the burdens of this short-term itis uh, and let them 
pursue their, their, their plans effectively. Uh, and uh, I think that formula is going to work with Chrysler as it's worked in so many other cases. What in particular interests you the most about Chrysler? You mentioned the product line, et cetera, et cetera. Could you just elaborate a little bit on what Chrysler's strengths are? Well, it's, it's got a terrific name. Chrysler, the, the name Jeep, Grand Cherokee, uh, uh, is, uh, are, are names that, that everybody knows and products that everybody knows. And, and they're, they're products that right now are, are in uh, the Chrysler Sebring. Are, are in, uh, in strong demand. So good products with strong demand, uh, great nameplates, uh, a, a good pipeline of new products that's coming on, uh, the, the ability with, through the relationship with, with Daimler to be in the forefront of the diesel technology. Uh, and uh, that's going to be very important to us going forward. And we will share uh, uh, platforms with, with uh, Daimler going forward and R&D technology with Daimler going forward. And Daimler is a recognized leader in this, uh, this, this area of, of new automotive technologies, particularly the diesel. So that's all a plus. But on top of that, uh, there's, there's a, a great dealer network. Some of them are here. Strong dealer network. Loyalty to the, to the company. And the fact, and this is really the heart of it, the company is underperformed. It can do better. We know it can do better. And I think we'll create an environment in which it can do better. That's, that's really the, the short answer. Create an environment in which a company that hasn't done its best can do a lot better. You stress the importance of long-term investment, but what are the benchmarks of success for Chrysler and how long do you think you uh, need to get there? Chrysler has in place now, uh, uh, developed by the, the management team, a five-year turnaround plan that will have it returning to profitability over that period of time. In uh, making the, the acquisition, uh, we looked hard at that plan and became convinced it was a good plan, it was a doable plan, it was a plan that had all the elements to return Chrysler to profitability and sustainable profitability. And then we said to ourselves, in the environment that Cerberus will create, we can do even better with these 150 highly skilled executives, uh, with the, the capital infusions we're, we're making, with uh, the uh, uh, active involvement of, uh, of, of, of a new parent. Uh, uh, we can do even better. So the five-year plan plus is what we see. How important is it that Chrysler be the lead negotiator in the upcoming UA UAW Big Three contract negotiations? And if Chrysler is the lead negotiator, what would be your primary issue in these negotiations? You know, I spent a lot of years on labor matters. And one of the things I learned in those long years dealing with uh, labor negotiations is you make a mistake if you parachute in and uh, try and in, get, put yourself in the middle of something that's uh, as complex as that. You become a tourist. I'm not going to be a tourist on labor negotiations. Chrysler, Chrysler reportedly has more people who want to take buyouts than there were buyouts offered. Do you think Chrysler should accelerate the buyout program? Again, uh, those issues of that sort uh, are, uh, are, are ones for the management team at, at, at Chrysler, uh, <coughs> which will be discussed with, with Cerberus, but we don't own Chrysler yet. <laughs> you know, we still have a way to go before we become the Chrysler owner, so I'm going to defer on answers to uh, questions like that. Well, one more try. Is Chrysler overstaffed? <laughs> uh, uh, again. You know, uh, I think we could run the tape recorder on that prior answer. Uh, we're uh, we're going to work closely with the with the Chrysler management. Uh, we're going to support them uh, and support their their plan. Their plan, I think, lays out a pretty good effort to improve productivity. Uh, 
enhancing productivity is at the center of that, of that five-year plan. And uh, it's a plan that I think is doable, and it's a plan that returns Chrysler to profitability, sustainable profitability, uh, and it, uh, it focuses on productivity and efficiency. So I think that plan's pretty good. Given your focus on the long term, will the new Chrysler still report monthly sales results? Yes, they will no longer have quarterly uh, public company reports. They'll no longer be subject to the sort of scrutiny from 26-year-old analysts, uh, <laughs> but uh, who always know more about the company than the management does. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, sure, their, 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 their sales numbers will continue to be public information. Do you think other automakers are nervous about the growing Cerberus holdings? I haven't seen that. Uh, our, our holdings uh, uh, include many uh, companies in the automotive space. Um, the automotive space has been difficult but it's created opportunities for a firm like us who believes we can turn things around. We, we can fix and, we can, and, and, and hold. Uh, but I don't see any concern. We, we're in, we, we own a number of auto supply companies. You know, we're the controlling uh, shareholder and owner of, uh, of GMAC, the big, uh, the big uh, uh, automotive finance company. But uh, I, I, think, uh, I, I think we've been We've been welcomed in the auto industry, and we're now on both sides of it. You know, we're on the supply side, we're on the finance side, and we're on the, the OEM side. Is Cerberus interested in Jaguar and Land Rover, and would you make an offer for Volvo? <laughs> uh, we, at what price? Yeah, what price, yeah. Well, here's our book. <laughs> uh, no, obviously we can't comment on, on, uh, on uh, any, any uh, transactions uh, one way or another, you know. So our, our answer to, is always uh, to questions like that. Uh, sorry, we just can't, can't comment. Why do you think U.S. automakers have fared so badly? Is it just labor costs or are there other things that need to be changed? Well, I think it's a whole, whole range of things. It's not, not any, any one thing. Uh, uh, I think they've They've, they've suffered a lot from, from rising health care costs, you know? I think rising health care costs has really uh, had a big effect on all uh, U.S. Uh, legacy companies, uh, the, the great uh, industrial companies of America on which the industrial framework of America has been built, uh, because they provide good benefits for their employees. <laughs> and uh, traditionally, traditionally have done so. And the way the system works, the people who aren't covered end up half the costs of the uncovered have to get picked up somewhere. And where do those costs go? Well, they, they go to, to the companies that provide good coverage. That's an inequity. That's an inequity that makes our companies less competitive. It's an equity that I hope uh, will be addressed. I'm pleased that Virtually all of the major presidential candidates uh, on both sides are talking about health care because health care has become uh, a very central issue to the competitiveness of America and beyond that to the long-term fiscal health of, uh, of, our, of our country. Uh, I'm pleased to see the, the attention that's being given. I hope it isn't just campaign rhetoric. I hope it's something that will have real legs to it and survive this because this is the issue of, of both American competitiveness going forward and it's the issue of American uh, fiscal uh, uh, stability going forward. If you just run the numbers on the unfunded uh, health care liabilities going out, these unfunded liabilities, what you will see is that in a couple of decades, they absorb all of the revenue stream of the United States government. Now that obviously can't, can't be allowed to happen. Uh, and dealing with those sorts of issues is very difficult. Uh, 
in the highly charged political environment we have. It takes courage to confront issues like that, issues like Social Security, issues like Medicare. Uh, it takes real political courage. And the unfortunate fact is if, if one side stands up and says, we have the courage to deal with it, the temptation on the other side is to say they're taking away your benefits. We saw that, we've seen that. So we have to rise to a new politics. We have to rise to a politics where the substance of the issue uh, is what's debated rather than the issue becoming uh, an opportunity for political advantage. And until we reach that point, so I hope the next President of the United States, whoever that might be, will, in, will begin their administration by calling for a bipartisan approach on, on the issue of, of, health, of health care. There are other issues, uh, and we obviously need at the bargaining table to address what can be addressed at the bargaining table. But the bargaining table can only get at part of it. It can't get at the biggest piece of it. What kind of a direction would you like this kind of health care reform to go in? What kind of bipartisan solution could there be? Well, the elements of it, uh, you can see in the candidates' various proposals, the elements are out there, uh, <clears throat> more reliance on consumers and consumer choice in markets. Uh, the Americans are essentially terrific consumers. Uh, when we go to buy a car, Boy, we, we really shop, you know? We know all the brands. Uh, we know price comparisons. We know quality comparisons. We go to the internet. We go to the dealer lots. We talk to our son in California or daughter in New York who knows more about cars than we do. We talk to our neighbors. We read the newspapers and we finally make a purchase. We know a lot about what we're buying. Contrast that to buying health care. We don't shop, we don't ask many questions, and we don't pay the bill, <laughs> right? Uh, we've got to get consumers more in the game, which is why I, I, I continue to support things like these health savings accounts, large, high deductible, uh, give, uh, give, give people protection in, in the event of, of a real risk, an insurance risk, give them protection. Uh, but make them think about that visit to the doctor. <laughs> make them ask themselves the question, do I really need that process or that procedure? Do I need that extra examination? I was making this argument on one of the national talk shows several years ago, and uh, one of the panelists as we were walking out said to me, hey, Mr. Secretary, I think you made a good point there. And I said, well, that's, that's great coming from you. <laughs> you don't usually uh, credit me with uh, I've been making, making a lot of good points because you're sort of a critic of all that we're about. He says, no, on this one, I'm serious. You, I think you made a good point. And I said, well, well why do you say that? He said, well, I, I went for my uh, annual physical. And the doctor, at the end of the physical, said, you're looking great. You're going to live to be 90. You're terrific. Uh, don't have anything to recommend. Just keep doing what, what you're doing. But by the way, there are a couple of tests I didn't give you. I don't think they'll amount to anything, but, you know, they're, they're uh, available if you want them. And the fellow said to me, you know, I thought about that, and I said to myself, well, why not get them? They're free. Yeah, they aren't free. <laughs> Somebody's paying for them. But we act as if health care is, is, is free. So I'd say one principle is let's, let's get consumers in the game. Let's create choice. Let's create markets. I think you've got to deal with the liability issue. I mean, I, I think it's a, uh, an important part of why our health care system operates the way it does. And it, it's, it, it's uh, in some ways the best in the world and in others uh, not anywhere close, uh, is, is the, the, the tort, tort reform. We need liability. We need to... We need to fix this system of punitive damages that uh, is chasing doctors out of the business early because of the risks to them of, 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 of lawsuits. Uh, so there's a lot we, there's a lot we, need, we need to do, uh, but uh, it, it, it will never get any of that done without a bipartisan approach, and it takes the President of the United States, the only way to get attention to an issue like this, 
is if the President of the United States says, you know, we've got to do it, and I'm going to call a bipartisan, uh, bi bipartisan meeting to get it done. And at that bipartisan meeting, uh, I wish Senator Moynihan was around, because he you know, chaired some of these commissions. And every commission he chaired, he began with the observation, look, we come here with different values, different parties, different backgrounds, different approaches. Uh, let's park our philosophy and our parties uh, for a while and look at the facts and see if we can't agree on the facts. And then after we agree on the facts, let's come back and resume our philosophical debate. But it would help if we, if we had the facts straight before we got into philosophy. It's a view I share. Um, you were in this administration for three years. Why didn't this president do what you're suggesting? On well, he care? tried on, on, on uh, Social Security. He made a, a valiant effort on Social Security. Um, really did. I think he showed courage and determination on Social Security. Uh, he, he spent a lot of political capital on, on, on Social Security. And uh, uh, the, the country, our political processes weren't ready. Uh, but I will always uh, 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 hold the president in enormous regard for that effort, commend him for it, and I think he put the company forward because we'll now start the next debate from, on Social Security from a higher plateau. He did help educate the country about, about Social Security. The, the, he, he did get Social Security as a, as a, a conversation topic on the breakfast uh, and dinner tables and so on. Uh, <coughs> but he never, we never got the, the full engagement that you need in a bipartisan way. And an issue of that significance uh, will only get resolved and can only get resolved when you're touching something as important to America as its social security system, you know, the great legacy of FDR if it's approached on a bipartisan, on a, on a bipartisan way, and, and you can't manufacture bipartisanship, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you gotta have people on the other side willing to stand up and say, we want a bipartisan approach too. Would it have been better to go for health care reform rather than social security reform? Well, I, I don't know. You can always Monday morning quarterback and uh, these, these, uh, these, these sorts of things. Uh, I think you, you, the reason to go for social security first <clears throat> This may sound odd, is it's a lot easier. It's a heck of a lot easier. Uh, Social Security is really just about arithmetic. Uh, and the arithmetic got laid out pretty well. In 1937, when the system got underway, people, life expectancy was 65 years, right? At that time, we had, I think it was 16 workers for every retiree. Today, the life expectancy is many more years, so people draw that Social Security much longer. Uh, and uh, importantly, there are only like 2.8 workers for every retiree. And with the baby boomers now be right on the cusp of the baby boomer retirement, it's going to go to two to one. Well, a system that makes sense based on the premise of people living to be 65 and 16 workers to one paying in, and now we're going to two to one, and people live 15 years longer, uh, the basic arithmetic doesn't work anymore. So we've got to get to a system that recognizes the realities of uh, longer lives and fewer workers paying, in, paying into the system. What do you think about criticism of President Bush as being out of touch, and what do you think his legacy will be? Well, I think the president uh, is a person of enormous determination and character. And if he thinks he's right, he's not going to look at the polls, and he's not going to be swayed by popular opinion, uh, which are the characteristics of a, real, of a real leader. I think he will go down in history as a, a man of determination, a man of character, and a man of courage, who, uh, uh, who, uh, made some tough calls. I mean, that call on Social Security was tough. Uh, the verdict on, on the Iraq, you know, is probably a verdict, as people say, uh, 
that will, will, history will judge that one 20 years from now or 25 years from now. It, uh, but uh, I think the verdict on the president will be a, a man of, uh, of courage and character, uh, decisive, uh, who stood by his guns. Uh, now some questions about private equity. Uh, there's a lot of con congressional attention on private equity funds and hedge funds these days. What do you see as the risks to the private equity industry's future, and what is your message for lawmakers uh, who criticize hedge funds and private equity? Well, I suppose a lot there, Jerry, depends on, on what, they're, what they're saying. But, 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 but <clears throat> taking the question broadly, uh, my answer is, look, Private equity plays an awfully important role today in, uh, in the way the American economy works and the way the global economy works. It's clearly been a positive for the U.S. economy and the global economy. There can't be any real question about, about that. Uh, when I was at Treasury, that was a subject that we continued to look into through the President's uh, uh, working group on financial markets. And uh, uh, I, I developed a uh, I think a pretty good appreciation of the, the role of, 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 of private equity and was a subject that we talked about at the finance minister's meetings and so on. Uh, governments need to monitor hedge funds, private equity. They need to understand it. Uh, we studied it when I was at Treasury, spent a lot of time on it, uh, and concluded that uh, in the case of hedge funds, uh, uh, a lighter regulatory approach was better. Uh, and uh, that's, I'm pleased to see, is, is, is a view that uh, continues to be, to be held by most finance ministries and most finance uh, 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 and central bank governors. Uh, at the same time, government needs to understand this, this, this phenomenon and monitor. And I think that's, a, that, that's healthy, that, that there is, that there is a, a continuing review of, 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 of the role of private equity. Uh, anything that's, that, that has such far-reaching, uh, far-flung, and important effects on an economy needs to be the subject of governmental attention. Then the question is, what do you do with it, you know? The idea to tax it more heavily, I think, carries a lot of risks. I think the idea of regulating it a lot more heavily carries a lot of risks that time here won't, won't, won't permit a, a full discussion of, but Keep in mind on the tax side, the principle, you always get less of anything you tax, right? <clears throat> if you raise the taxes on an activity, you'll find you get less of it. That, that was why we, when I was in the Bush administration, we wanted to lower the taxes on investment, <laughs> reduce dividends and capital gains taxes. Because if you reduce taxes on capital, you get more capital. And more capital has a beneficial effect on the economy as a whole as evidenced by all the good numbers you know, that we, we, we've seen since those tax cuts took, took effect, including on the revenue side of the U.S. Treasury, <laughs> where, where we've had a, a virtual gusher of revenues ever since those tax cuts took, took effect. Uh, same in private equity. If you, if you tax it more heavily, uh, you'll get less of it. It's important also, and this must be the question of carried interest, that we keep the categories of income straight. If what's being earned is ordinary income, then it should be taxed as ordinary income. But under the code of the United States, what is risk returned, what is returned to capital, gets taxed at the capital gains rates. That's an awfully important analytical concept. Uh, it's also a very important practical concept because millions of Americans have organized their business affairs around the principle of uh, partnerships that, uh, that bear risks that are taxed as capital gains. <laughs> and that's virtually every business that gets organized in America. And it's the, it's the oil and gas joint ventures partnerships, and it's the real estate partnerships, and it's the small businesses. So that's a very important concept to keep in mind as we think about it. On the regulation side, uh, I think the best regulation is always the market itself. And uh, uh, the most effective way to regulate uh, hedge funds, private equity funds, is through the counterparties that today do the monitoring, betting, and policing. And they do a good job. 
Is the success of private equity firms an indictment of the current state of the U.S. public company, and is the focus on quarterly results uh, ultimately sometimes destructive to overall long-term corporate performance? Uh, <clears throat> the public markets are efficient, and they're made more efficient because of private equity. Uh, private equity is always sitting there watching what's going on in the public markets. If the company underperforms, uh, and they can underperform for a variety of reasons, sometimes it's this short-termitis. Uh, sometimes the particular company in question is sort of an orphan in the, in the corporate world. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's away from the core mission of the company, the larger company, and it doesn't get the attention it needs. Uh, uh, in circumstances like that, uh, private equity uh, plays a very beneficial role. It, uh, it, it allows management to focus on the long term. Uh, it allows it to make capital investments that often public markets, in the cases of particular companies, won't allow because the public market would rather have a buyback of shares uh, than they would an investment in the long term. Uh, the management would rather take the long view and reward the shareholders three, four, five years from now rather than today. On the theory that the reward three, four, five years from now is a lot bigger than the reward we can pay you today if we can make that investment and turn this situation around. So sure, there, there are, there are a, a number of instances where private equity is a better answer. But it's not a panacea, and it's not universal. Uh, we're, I'm not contending here that public companies should all go private. Far from it. Uh, there are some uh, that should, and many, many, many that, that, that should stay the way they are. We're almost out of time, but before I ask the last question, we've got a couple of other important matters to tend to. First of all, let me remind our members of our future speakers. On Friday, uh, July 20th, General James Conway, the Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, will be with us. On July 23rd, uh, Mel Carmazan, CEO and Director of Sirius Satellite Radio, will be here. And our July 24th speech has actually been postponed, so I won't announce it. <laughs> Secondly, uh, we have many traditions here at the National Press Club, as you know, having been here before. And we're going to be crowding up your office wall with another plaque. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And, of course, last but not least, ah, the National the Press Club mug. Thank you, Jerry, <laughs> very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And the last question is a Chrysler corp Corporation question, and that would be, are there any plans to bring back the K-car? <laughs> uh, I remember that, that car well and many, many other Chrysler cars that you all know. My first car was a DeSoto, a 1947 DeSoto. Very few of you were even, Glenn, you and I were around then, but <laughs> very few others. Uh, I can't say, uh, I can't give a specific answer to that, but I can tell you we are going to be focused on producing really high quality, good cars that. Uh, America, uh, um, Americans will want to drive. Thank you, Jerry, very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'd like to thank you for coming today. I'd also like to thank National Press Club members Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's lunch. Also, thanks to the National Press Club's library for its research. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by the National Press Club's Broadcast, Information, or Broadcast Operations Center. Press Club members can also access free transcripts of our luncheons at our website, www.press.org, and non-members may purchase transcripts, audio, and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Thank you. We're adjourned.